Look at you, hacker. Pathetic creature of meat and bone. Oh, no, sorry. Wrong script. Greetings, listeners. D and Daniel here. I have survived my transgression. I am full of dice again. My belly rumbles with chance and probability. But anyway, I want to thank our patrons, Mario, Hedwig, and Matt, and our new patron, Anseline. Thank you all. Hello, and welcome to the Probably Bad Podcast, a podcast which is definitely bad. I'm Pencil. I'm Paper. Today's Probably Bad RPG idea is... The Warlock's patron is actually a wizard running an elaborate scam that got him way too deep. He's really just following them round with an invisibility enchantment and casting the appropriate spells of needed that was submitted by uh, Rubik's Cube 60. Before anyone says it, I know that Critical Role has a god who, spoilers, is actually a, a fey being doing all sorts of weird shit, but I feel this is sufficiently different, and I want to talk about it. And I've not listened to Critical Role, so anything I say can't be considered a rip-off. So I, I think my first thought <laughs> on seeing this was... You know, there's a lot of spells that only one of those two groups can cast. Hmm. So imagining, like, the warlock tries to cast Eldritch Blast and the wizard's just there like, Oh shit, oh shit, magic missile! I'm just thinking, picturing it as like the warlock is the patron is like, ah, oh, you've got a special deal where you can use all of these extra spells, and all you need to do is not look too closely into where the spells are coming. I like the idea that they still get um, like the warlock number of spell slots. Just yeah. the wizard's really lazy. You have half as many spell slots because it takes me a while to get out of bed. I need the rest of my spell slots to stay invisible. Like, actually, at this point, how long does invisibility last? Because I know that, like, that's possibly, like, going into too much detail. But I think it's a few hours. A second. Yeah, concentration up to an hour. So, yeah, that's why that's why warlocks have so few spell slots, because the wizard has to use almost all of them to keep casting invisibility on themselves. You're a special kind of of warlock who can't use second level spells. I'm using those slots. I like you're a special kind of warlock who's less good as a bargain. It's a mistake to get third level slots early. Hmm. Like is it like, oh, you want to summon a ghost horse to ride around? That's fine, but you can't use rope trick. That's that's too much. To be fair, has anyone ever used rope trick? I'm genuinely interested. Has anyone ever used rope trick? Hmm? did technically use it. Okay, so there we go. For the first time in D&D history, someone has used Rope Trick. I do like all the, like, very minor, pointless D&D spells. Really? You know, they do have their moments, but just very specific moments. Hmm. Yeah, so, like, going back to the actual idea, rather than my hatred of rope trick and everything about it. I like I feel like if it turns out that all patrons are wizards casting invisibility, that could be a big twist for your campaign. Not a good twist, but a big twist. Oh so one of your play characters is the war. And the other three player characters are the wizards, who are all invisible and all trying to keep up the facade of this being a warlock. So it's it's basically a farce. Mm. The warlock has like 
level one common estates. Warlock and NPC, that could be quite a fun one shot of us trying yeah. not to get caught. Or you just give the Warlock player like. I was gonna say give the Warlock player a fake character sheet to have them sit on a, sit on their own in a room. You they just might like pick some things up if you said they're in two different rooms. <laughs> This is a completely normal D&D game, but also, would you mind going in this sound room for the entire thing while we slip you notes under the door? Playing a game of D&D just through passing notes would be interesting. Yeah. I'm now wondering, you know, because so many classes are online still. Just like running a text-based D and D game during a maths class. It's it's all the fun of slipping notes in maths class, but now you get to be wizards. Yeah. What? Yeah, you take you take damage if the um if the teacher suspects something. Okay, so the teacher, you're trying to convince the teacher that they're a warlock. And all of you are passing notes to do so. So we've got away from the idea, but also this sounds fun. Hmm. Like every t like every time like the teacher like every time the teacher gets annoyed at something, you hack the camera so it looks like it's vanished to everyone except the teacher. I think what I've invented is an elaborate form of psychological torture, but two steps away from gaslight your maths teacher, which we do not condone. No, I don't, I don't think it's any steps away from that, so don't gaslight your maths teacher. There's some good advice. There was an RPG based around texting, but like, being done only over text. Okay, it is one of the ones which is on my list of things to play, so I can't tell you whether it's any good or not. But it seems interesting. But go back to the actual idea. Yeah, to get back to the actual idea, which I think was Gaslight yeah, Master. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean... Just thinking about some of the Warlock patron options, it's not that far off, some of them. Yeah. Because all that a Warlock is really is someone who gets someone else's powers to do the work. Yeah, all they are is, mag is someone who has a magical sugar daddy. Like, I definitely think that, like, an arc mage would work as a patron idea. I don't know if it's an official one, but I think it would work. It would definitely work. Hmm. Yeah, there's an interesting class in there, like arch mage patron. Or arc warlock patron, who is not like being a patron to a new generation of warlocks. It's warlocks all the way down. I mean, it's on Earth Darkana, but there is. Um, the Seeker patron, which is basically someone that travels around searching for knowledge, and is is that not a wizard? Hmm. Yeah. It's an unusually sociable wizard. The one wizard who can hold a conversation with someone for more than, like, two minutes. That's how they became a patron. Also going back to the original idea. Because you could do it with other classes. Now why do you have a druid who's just constantly a tree near the warlock? What? What is how how would you explain just there's trees everywhere? We're in this this terrible dungeon and that tree that grew outside my house is also here. Like, the thing is, it's like, so that's the mystery of the campaign, is where this tree keeps coming from, whether you are, you know, 
chosen by nature spirits or there's a dryad. And then we go to the stupidest possible explanation, which is that there's a druid disguised as a tree following you, making you look cool. Druids that occasionally casts command and just says, ignore the tree. Hmm. Wait, can druids cast command? I don't oh. actually know. Ah, uh, they can do all kinds of things. I don't think they can cast command. Like, they can hit you with branches until you ignore the tree. Do a, a geese. Yeah. So so the, you will notice it, but you're not physically capable of acknowledging it. Druid invisibility is where they just summon a goose into your face, and then while you're distracted by the goose in your face, they walk into the place. I mean, yes, but also yes. Ah, yes. Mandy spell. That does make that does make more sense than they summon a geese. But also, oh, so. he's flying in your face. Are you really going to notice a vaguely familiar tree? The warlock must solve the mystery of why people keep why geese keep manifesting in their face. You've got the warlock who is being convinced they have like magical powers by like wizard, but the wizard isn't actually a wizard. They're being convinced they have magical powers by the warlock, and it's an endless like cycle when you move them have actual magic. Where does the, the magic actually come from? The druid. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this mysterious tree. I do like this game that's full of like twists and secrets, but they're all incredibly dumb. <laughs> like you put up like a bunch of like intriguing mysteries to begin with, and every layer the players uncover. The mysteries just get like worse and worse answers. The person that asked on the Patreon exclusive server about good secrets for character creation enjoys these secrets. Yeah, it turns out you don't have magic, there's just a tree behind you. Shall we move on to questions? Maybe we should. Okay, our first question comes from. Was the, the, the. Our first question is anonymous. Other than ubiquitous, be flexible. Do you have any tips for a first time DM? Yes, I am fully aware of what well, I just asked for DM tips. Bring your worst. Eat the 20 in front of your players to assert your dominance. Do you understand if you would much better lock one of your players in a soundproof room and only pass the messages under the door? Like, in terms of actual advice, the sort of the best sort of DM system I found is from Monster of the Week, which is um the mystery tracker. Which is essentially you write down what would happen if the players did absolutely nothing. And then you can sort of use that to sort of extrapolate how people react to what they do. Mm. So it's like kind of, yeah, this is this is what the villain will be doing if not stop them. So you have a good grasp of their overall plans or whatever's causing the conflict. And then you can sort of, it's much easier to see how the plans will change around that. Yeah, so it's remembering that your players... While they are the protagonists, they're not the only people doing things, and things will continue without their characters. Yeah. So on to terrible ideas. I just also <laughs> say, use your, pl- use your characters' backstories against them. Mm. Like, side quests, surprising stuff that pops up, connections to whoever is doing the bad stuff. It, yeah, it all. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, backstories are a useful source of character and plot things. Which is what Paper said, but better. Yeah, so that advice, eat the dice for dominance. I don't like 
how one of your players is running their character. Maybe they're one of those characters that just refuses to go along with any plot hooks. Just slowly shred their character sheet until they agree to play the adventure. Eat their character sheet for dominance. Because the player's like, oh yeah, I'm taking this disruptive spell, and you just grab their character sheet, brush it up into a ball, and swallow it while making unblinking eye contact. Find out what food your players like, and then only bring snacks that they don't like. Hmm. To assert your dominance. Just, just like, eat everyone else's copy of the player's handbook. Now only you know the rules. At the start when of the campaign, your, when planning your campaign, be sure to include at least six background clowns. Your characters will be convinced that they're going to lead to a, to something, but they never will. At the start of the campaign, challenge the biggest, strongest player to a fight to show that you're not to be fucked with. Unfortunately, if you lose, they do become the DM. So, yeah. just watch out for that. Like the old, like the, the sort of ideal D D game. There's no DM at the start, but all the players just have a cage match at the beginning, and whoever wins is the DM. Uh, but that's sort of fallen out of favour a bit these days. Although you know, it can still attract Ian Daniel easily if you have a cage fight at the beginning live in a cage, so it's kind of a homing yeah. instinct. Hmm. Like any cage you have, D and Daniel might be there. That's not yep. so much a D and D act, but it's an important warning. So if you ever see a cage out in the woods, make sure to throw some dice in, just in case mm. you repeat him. I hope this helps with your first um, DM experience. So our second question is also anonymous. I can speak. Um, you've mentioned just making Rincewind as a character, but are either of you familiar with the Discworld TTRPG? General thoughts on RPG settings in established worlds. I don't like them. Yeah, I it also... too much pressure to stick to established lore, especially if it's an established world that any of your players are into. So I don't yeah, do it. I think my main problem uh, is that a lot of fictional worlds that are designed for stories, because that's what almost all fictional worlds are, designed for a specific story, are based around that specific, those characters and their arc. Uh, And it's hard to sort of disconnect it from them in an easy way. What we're saying is, if your characters aren't relevant yeah. to Harry's journey... Well, yes, fundamentally, your characters are not relevant to Harry's journey and thus are unlikely to, like, get involved in lots of the big world things. I haven't played the Discworld RPG, but I imagine it would be better than most just because the whole mm. world is very developed, so there's a yeah, bit think... more that you can do with it. I think it sort of helps that this world doesn't really have a main character. Or a main plot. Like it's a collection of shorter stories. I am, yeah, I'm running a RPG. It's set in a, set in a, like, set in an established world. Nick Lake's uh, edit out my being crap, please. Um, Set in an established world at the moment. Uh, It's in the Magnus Archives. And I needed to, like, essentially put it on a different continent to avoid repeatedly running into law conflicting with everything. So it is possible. With it being an ongoing piece of media, because things could change. Yeah. At at what point have you diverged from canon? And then at what point have you diverged from canon so much that it's no longer in that setting? And then can you do other stuff with it, or do you need to still stick close? And it just... It gets very foggy. Yeah, I think it's easier... If you are going to... 
Uh, I think it's easiest to just yeah explicitly say yeah this is this is non cat this is an alternate universe because it makes it easier if you sort of mess up the law a bit and it also you know allows your players more freedom because otherwise there's a lot of possibility of you can't do that because it will interfere with episode thirteen. Yeah, I feel like unless it's post canon, you either mm. can't do anything big and significant, or like you say, it's 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 an AU. Yeah, I think if I I think probably the best way to do it is simply if you if you want to do it in like the sort of area the story happens, kill the main character. Uh, and your characters are now the main character. Yeah, that makes sense, because if, if you're playing in an established place, what you really want to do a lot of the time is be the protagonist of that setting. Yeah, I mean, essentially, yeah, like a point of you sort of established things is, oh yes, I would like to be the protagonist, I'd like to be Luke Skywalker or Harry Potter or whoever you want to be so i don't really aggressive no one, no one plays a lord of the rings game to just hang out in gondor yeah you play lord of the Rings games because you want to be the fellowship and if you do that just be the fellowship i feel like we got a little bit ranty but i hope we answered your question <laughs> yes um So, our final question is from Latella. If you nut in the astral plane, do it push you backwards? So I've been I've been thinking about this one and I've looked at the actual description of the astral plane in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and it sounds like it's more of an ocean than sort of avoid really so i feel like it wouldn't push you backwards so much as make make the waters a bit murky hmm. so like so there's no fifth edition manual for planes yet so i looked at the third edition manual for planes uh and it seems that the astral plane that is more of like a psychic void so my theory Either it would push you backwards if you believed it would push you backwards, like as a sort of mental realm. So if you think, oh, this will push you backwards, it will push you backwards. Or it pushes you, like, psychologically backwards, like it regresses your character development every time you must see the astral plane. Being a psychic plane as well is like, what if you just can't quite get yourself there? Hmm. Like the there there is a secondary question to ask, which is, can you nut in the astral plane? Yeah, I mean, like in a lot of cases, you're sort of not in your actual body in the astral plane, you're in like an astral form. So, can astral forms not? No, no. it's the real question that you're asking, Latella. Um. So sorry, I, I've got the got the manual of the planes open right now. Um, astral astral uh, forms again. This is all third edition, so it's debatable whether it's still canon, but it's not really been gone into in great detail in fifth edition. Um, they don't biologically heal, and they don't die, which sort of implies they're not biological anymore. Yeah, if I don't you can't think do it... the big death. You can't do the little death. That is that's why. That's what I always say. It is true. I I did live with them for a year, and they do say that at least once a day. Completely forgot it. Um, but yeah, it seems like okay. It seems like if you go there in astral form, you can't not, and so it can't push you forwards or backwards. Uh, but if you go in, it's basically it pushing you forwards now. What is the anatomy of the astral form? There's a lot of weird biology in D and D, you know. I'm sure there's some creature with like a dick growing out of its back in one of the monsters. It's inclusive. Hmm. Um. But if you go there physically, I feel that yeah, it depends on whether or not you think it will push you backwards. 
because I don't think the astral plane has enough physical matter. No, wait, no, that's that's the thing that makes it push you backwards because there's not a lot stopping you. Hmm. But I mean, there is also, you know, there's myriad homebrew settings. For example, yeah. in, in, my, in my homebrew setting, the astral plane is the void between <clears throat> other planes. And yeah, which is sort of a common place, so that it would push you backward in my personal astral plane. So really consult with your DM. Mm. I'm not going to lie. Nothing would push you backwards in my personal astral plane. I can't tell whether that sounds like a pickup line or like shooting someone down. But it sounds like yeah. something. It feels like a threat. Yeah. Oh, buddy, it pushed you backwards. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that, in case you're wondering, that was the first question I did, like, proper research for. So. I'm glad we have a semi-official answer. So, on that note, thank you for listening. If you have a question, you can email probablybadpodcast at gmail dot com or message probably bad RPG ideas on Tumblr. Um, if you want to support us, um, you can go to patreon dot com slash probably bad RPG ideas and get access to the Patreon exclusive Discord server that we mentioned, uh, Homebrew, which when this episode goes up, the other things that aren't quite owl bears will have gone up. Um, and also bonus episodes. Most recent of those being, I believe, Night at the Ninja Museum, where I run my usual Wednesday D and D group through being ninjas trying to rob the ninja museum. It goes about as well as you'd expect. But Nick does really cool music for it. Um, if you don't want to pay for that nonsense, um, you can also leave us a rating or a review or share us with someone. Um, doesn't really matter who. Share us we'll with. Take I mean, you know, may, maybe not your priest if you don't want to be excommunicated, but who, whoever you think needs some nonsense in their life. Um, and remember to have a probably bad day.